You're joining the Dr. Business Podcast with Dr. Holland Meyer, where we talk business sprinkled with a bit of Jesus. Our goal is to help you simplify business, impact more lives, and increase your profitability. By sharing the stories of influential doctors from various specialties, we help you get creative in connecting with your target market, increasing your exposure in the community, and collaborating with local providers so you can reach more people and avoid burnout. Thanks for tuning in, and we're excited to help you navigate success in your doctor business. And now your host, Dr. Holland Meyer. And welcome back for another podcast. I'm Dr. Holland Meyer, along with my guest, Dr. Roddy Rahimi out of Arizona. Thanks for joining us, Roddy. Thanks for having me. You bet. Now, Dr. Roddy is the CEO and president of BackFit Health and Spine, and it's one of the most innovative and patient care-driven multi-specialty health clinics in Arizona. And I don't want to leave out that he's become quite the businessman over the years. Uh, He's got nine clinics in Arizona, four out of state, three pain centers, and he's onboarding more in multiple states. Now, Dr. Roddy, um, you know I look up to you in so many ways. If you can fill in the gaps for us on kind of who you are in the space of business, but also just a regular human being as well. Yeah, thank you for that uh, nice introduction. Um, We are, um, you know, I'm always pinching myself every day to kind of stay grounded to kind of where we started as a family owned and operated business as we still are. My sister and I collaborated and, and came together to open up BackFit back in 2002. So um, our growth trajectory has only been, um, has only happened because of the people that we've had with us. We've had people in our, in our team uh, of 350 plus employees now that have been with us since the first day and are so passionate about the level of healthcare that we provide and the results that we get with our patients. And uh, so that's fueled me, you know, initially I worked in the, I was in the trenches and working in the practices for a long, long time. And in the last, I want to say about eight years, I've been out of the trenches and working more on the, the business side of it and uh, really been on the forefront of trying to grow our brand, grow our model, trying to get this type of healthcare to into many as many families as possible here we can in the Phoenix market. But now we have uh, been blessed and have had the privilege to, to be able to branch out in different states as well. So that that's what fuels me. That's what gets me excited. That's what gets me up at five o'clock in the morning every day to keep grinding and having fun. And I think that if you're not having fun doing it, it's really not worth doing personally. So absolutely. And I can also state just as far as like the patients sticking around and your employees sticking around the level of care that you provide, but I don't want to breeze over too quickly, the level of leadership that you also provide. And that's what we're going to get into today. Now, started out as one clinic but how did you create and develop this vision that you've got to be so grand and so big and in, in, in this style of practice can you share a few tips with our listeners you bet you bet i mean it's it's, it's never easy right i mean it, a lot of times uh you know when when you are going to to multiply something at first it's very difficult i think the key is that you fail and you fail often and you fail early and you fail forward as much as you can and you learn from those when we opened up our you know, third location and our fourth location, we were just looking for different failures. We, we were familiar with the failures we had before. We were just looking for different failures because those failures to me have always been opportunities to grow and do better. And um, like I said, it's the, the expansion for us. You know, I'm one person. My sister's one person. Some of our executive team collectively, we're like eight people, but we can't do this alone. And I think when you're developing other leaders and you're engaging and motivating people or really looking into pe- looking in your organization, kind of going, okay, who are leaders in my organization that I have to lift up and mentor? Uh, that's what really allows us to do what we do. That's awesome. And you mentioned failure quite a bit. And throughout the caliber of people I've been interviewing, they, they tend to gravitate toward that conversation. Like, let's not ignore it. It's not a bad thing. And so I'm glad you just went there yourself. What, how did you develop that perspective of failure? Is that something you learned in your household growing up or is that something you learned because it happens in business? Yeah, I think a little bit of both. My parents were not doctors, were not in the healthcare field. My parents were in the retail space and business and I saw them succeed, but I also saw, even as a little kid, you know, they wouldn't share, hey, we had a really bad month this month. But you know, you can just kind of tell things weren't going as well as they should, but I guess my modeling was the perseverance is the, hey, the only option is the win. You know, if we're going to, you know, if you, I'm sure the analogy has been used. If we're going to take over this island, we got to burn the boats. The only option is to win, you know. So 
So that's kind of the mentality that's been instilled upon me and my mentors and people that I look up to, people that I read about or listen to and podcasts and audiobooks. And I'm constantly trying as a leader, I think that you constantly have to feed your soul in order to, you know, feed other people. So um, I'm, I'm obviously uh, nowhere where I want to be. I'm still a student in the process, always learning and trying to surround myself with people that are going to lift me up because there's plenty of people that are going to pull you down. Those are the people you got to stay away from and uh, really kind of align yourself with people that challenge you and, and get you to do things, things that you just didn't think that you had the ability to do. That's awesome. And you had mentioned it also earlier that you start the next business or the next practice and you're looking for failures. Where would you say is your most successful failure? Oh my gosh. How much time do we have? I mean, I could <laughs> talk about that for hours. I mean, I don't, I, I can't, I can't think of one specific thing. I mean, when we, when we're, when we're about to open up a brand new clinic, zero patients, obviously we know we're opening up an office. We, we've taken maybe eight months to a year to, you know, go through the process of construction and build out. So I think if we've ever failed, it's the marketing leading up to it. And we've, we've kind of mastered that now where when we open up a brand new clinic, we're flooded with hundred to 200 new patients the first month because we've done the things in advance to kind of create the buzz in the community, create the urgency for patients, put on a great event and things like that. There's, there was a couple scenarios where those things didn't go as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but gosh, I, I can't think of one specific thing that I would say, uh, uh, you know, uh, that sticks, sticks out in my head. Yeah, but marketing to open up a practice. I mean, after you've done it 13, 14, 15 times, I mean, seems like you would learn a thing or two of what not to do and what definitely to do. I know. You're absolutely right. There's always something. There's always, I mean, there's never been a perfect opening. And I hope we never encounter a perfect opening because, again, then there's not an opportunity to grow. So even being here in Chandler, Arizona, in our corporate office, and we're onboarding clinics and out of, out of state, we're not on a plane every day going to different clinics. So we're having to do and deliver what we do here locally, you know, 10,000 miles away. And that's, that's kind of tricky. You know? so <laughs> that's a whole nother beast to tackle. Oh my gosh. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. What's the best investment that you've made in your business or in your practice? Well, I think the best investment for me, I mean, in my position, there's so many people that rely on me. Like I said, we have over 350 employees now and in some capacity, every single one of those relies on me. And I know that although I don't know everybody's, I'm not in, a, I don't get to work with everybody every day, obviously, but I know that I'm affecting them. I'm affecting their, their families and what they provide for their families. I really take that um, very personal and I take that to heart. So in order for me to do that, the biggest investment personally that I need to make is in myself. And I need to make sure that I'm healthy, number one, I'm, I'm active. I'm feeding my soul, I'm feeding myself daily and taking the time to, to, to do the things I do in my morning ritual, doing the things that I need to do and to go and get more information and get on a plane and go to a conference that's uplifting and, and things like that. Because if I'm not constantly keeping my tank full, there's no way that I can spread that love with everybody that is really relying on me to do that. So it might, I don't think you can put enough hours or dollars into yourself as far as an investment goes if you're trying to grow as an individual. Right. And growth as an individual, I mean, it leaks out into every single area of your life. You know, you can't, you can't help it whether you're not growing or whether you are growing, the fruits of your labor will show, right? Absolutely. hundred percent. hundred percent. So you had mentioned your morning ritual. What does that look like for you? Oh man. So my morning ritual has changed a lot. I'm a morning person. I get up and you know, my, the first two hours of my morning are kind of my time to, to get set. Uh, you know, there's days, even though we don't get snow here in Phoenix, there's some cold mornings where you're like, I don't want to get out of bed. But once I make myself do that, um, recently I've changed it. Um, recently I get up, I have my cup of coffee, I do a cold plunge, I get out, I meditate for 15 minutes, I read, and then I get started. And then I'm, I'm, I'm very involved with family life as well. So I, I like to get my kids off to school and, and then go to the gym. That's kind of like my motoring routine. I don't really start my day, my work day until about 9, 30, 10. Because I, I, you know, and a lot of people say, well, gosh, what are you doing for those three hours? I'm like, well, that's my time. Like, I don't care if I, I'd rather go from 10 to 6 or 10 to 8 or 10 to 10 than be somewhere at 7 a.m. Because then I'm compromising what I need to do to, to, to feel good throughout the day. So, so that, that ritual, uh, that routine has been really, really fun for me to do the last, uh, I've really been diligent to that for probably about the last five months or so. Okay. Uh, in the past, it was always morning, getting up. 
reading, meditating, gym, like that's just my routine every day and uh, allows me to get set. And uh, I'm good about not jumping on emails and getting immersed because I could get on emails and be on there for, you know, 10 hours, you know. And I, that can steal your time very quickly in the morning. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. So you had mentioned meditation. Um, how has your spiritual life or being connected to yourself played a role in your business life? I think it's really, really important. I think that goes back to your other question about what do you invest in or what is the biggest investment? I think that piece, as challenging as it is, because it's not an easy thing to do, and I'm always looking for ways to do it better, more efficient, because the most common thing you hear from people is like, I don't have time to uh, meditate or I don't have time to um, go to church or whatever their, whatever their thing is, you know, and, and, and for me, I didn't have the privilege of growing up in, you know, in a, in a house that was religious or anything like that. So, but mindfulness and, and those things like that were something that, uh, you know, I knew were important, but I, it took me a while to kind of implement those things. And, and uh, it's just really, it allowed me to kind of stay centered more consistently, uh, reflect, uh, reflect on blessings, reflect on gratitude, because it's really easy to talk and think about the things that aren't going well. Mm -hmm. But when you sit down and you give yourself 10 minutes, which I don't think anybody is too busy to have 10 minutes to themselves. Yeah. And um, to, to reflect on those things, it really just allows me to keep a more positive perspective on everything that's going well in my life. And, and even the things that are challenging. We have a, I mean, I have a lot of challenges right now. And, and even those things, you tend to work through those challenges when, you're to, when your state of mind is at where it really should be. You know, so. Yeah, I can relate to that. The last couple of years, I've focused on this more than ever as far as like, and I'm sure you can relate to this, all day long, like the wheels are turning in your headspace, like they don't stop. And for me, like they never stopped. And so the last two or three years, I've really focused on trying to just be still, like even quiet in my mind and how difficult that is, but how oh valuable that is. Oh my God, any type A person, if, you can, if you're type A, which I know you are, because I am, uh, any type A that can sit down for 10 minutes and just not think about anything, right. that is a workout. Talk about the ultimate workout. Like that is not easy. It's still not easy for me because I'll start to do it and I listen to something specifically to guide me. Right. But then I go, oh, geez, I gotta, can't remember, can't forget to do this later today and stuff. So, yeah, that's a form of mental toughness that I've yeah. had to yeah. develop and learn and, and kind of build that muscle. So let's go into some things that our listeners can start to implement like into their practice or into their business. And I want to start with connection. What are some ways or techniques that you've been able to connect with your target market in practice? You know, for us, um, regardless if you have one office or 500 offices, it really, it's irrelevant. The connection is what is that target? First you have to identify what is your target? You know, a lot of practitioners, uh, you know, that I coach because I, you know, as you know, I coach on the side as well. A lot of practitioners don't really know what their demographic is. They don't really know what they're looking for. They just know that they need to look for something, but it's much more effective when you have a target, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. you don't want to just throw darts at a wall. You want to have a bullseye. You're like, where's my target, you know, to throw those darts at. So every community, every city is a little bit different. Um, for us, we know what our demographic of patients are. So we know there's passive ways of getting those patients. There's active ways of getting those patients like what are we willing to invest in to do those things so i mean it's just determining what that target is i think is the most important step before you start going and spending or wasting a lot of money on on media that just doesn't result in anything right because you've got to know where they hang out right like where where they hang out where they go online like so that you're putting your dollars where it makes sense and so many doctors i feel like um leave it up to chance or just say i treat everybody with a spine or if it's an ortho i treat everybody you know with bones you know and so they kind of treat everybody so what you're saying is actually have an avatar and like a, a target like picture that person walking through your door so you know who to go after is that what you're yeah, saying absolutely i think if you put it out there and you're very focused on what you're looking for I think we all would agree that you know once you focus on and visualize it, those are the types of people you're going to attract. I mean, we're going to still get certain people that are there. If you're a corrective care practitioner like we are, and you have a patient that's just there for pain management or or, or whatnot, they don't really buy into what you do. You're still going to get those people, and I feel you still need to, you know, love and care for those people like everybody else. But um, but I think it's just kind of what your focus is, and I think a lot of doctors when it comes to marketing and 
and knowing, and, and they all want new patients. They all want new patients, but it's like, okay, well, what kind of new patient do you want? Number one. And number two, why are you always looking for new patients? Why don't you keep the ones you have? Why don't you focus on retention? Why don't you focus on doing things that will build that rapport permanently or create lifers as we call them in our practices, you know? Yeah. So. Absolutely. The next one is exposure. And you have been so successful at this as far as like, my question is, how have you been successful getting more exposure and becoming known in your community? Because you guys, y'all become known before you ever open your doors. Like, what is your genius in that? Can you share some tips with us? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, you know, I just think it's, and again, I just, a lot of times when I talk to physicians about this, they kind of, a lot go, well, it's easy for you guys to do because you have nine locations. No, because it wasn't very long ago where we just had one. Right. Yeah, marketing becomes more feasible when you have multiple locations. Obviously, the costs go down and your, your net that you're putting out there is much greater. I, I totally understand that. I don't avoid that. But I still think an office with one office, with a doctor, one office, one front office staff or in a mid-level or whatever the model is, um, I just think that it's, it's about building that trust in the community. We've always, and we still will be very immersed in our respective communities that we have clinics in. And we want people to know us. We want, I mean, we joke about it and we're nowhere close to being that, but we want, when people want coffee, they think of Starbucks. When people want healthcare, we want them to think of BackFit. That's kind of what we're working towards. And that's our vision. And we'll never cross a finish line because I don't think a finish line exists, but you know, it's just, it's just, I can't, again, it's not one thing. I just think it's a really just, finding out what you're comfortable in doing, whether it's digital marketing or if, you, if you're a provider or business owner that likes to do lectures. I mean, there's things that you may like to do, but then there's things that have the greatest return. You know, I like speaking. I like speaking in front of people. And I did that a million times and I still do. But I know now with digital marketing, that's not giving us the same return of a, a really stellar Facebook ad that garners you know, 300 patients, you know, type of thing. So, yeah, yeah, I think that's great. And also to be adaptable to the times changing is important. Yeah, and absolutely. consistency, because that's one thing that y'all are really great about just being, ex just, just being available and seen in the community. Y'all are consistent with it. It's not like once a year you do something for the, for something, you know? Yeah, I think consistency is key. I think what we typically do, like we're getting ready to start to do our marketing plan for next year. For 2021, we've already set what we're doing for this year. It's done. You know what I mean? There might be curveballs, maybe an event that gets canceled or a new opportunity, but we've already invested all of our dollars for 2020. Now we're looking to see, okay, do we want to resume the same TV uh, model or the radio model for 2021 and 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 uh, things like that? And you're absolutely right. A lot. I'm speaking to a doctor this morning who was doing a certain type of advertising, print. I mean, I'm not sure who does print material anymore. At least in our in our community, that doesn't work anymore. But but if you're not changing with the times, you, I mean, you're just, you're going to get passed up. Nobody's going to stop and wait for you. You know what I mean? So you have to, if you don't have the knowledge, which I am not a social media expert by any means, but I know um, how important that is. So if you don't know how to do it, go get some education on it. Hire somebody, hire a firm, whatever it is. Just not knowing is not an answer for to do nothing, you know, so. Right. And you're not doing just social media. You're never doing one thing. You you do a bunch of different things so that, I mean, the months, the oh, months, yeah. the patients, the flow, uh, and you're not stuck. If one thing doesn't work, then you're screwed, right? No, no, we would never do that. We would, we diversify. Like I said, we're pretty, we're very diligent on active marketing. So we have event, you know, uh, marketing coordinators are out in the community and we have, you know, a slew of those people they are out in community, they're booking events. We're doing corporate wellness, corporate lectures, even we even go to things that we don't get any new patients out of, but it's, we're letting our presence be known. They're looking at the brand. They're seeing what we do. And then of course the digital marketing, the more passive stuff is equally important. Television, radio, a little bit more cost costly, probably not advantageous for a single location to do something like that. But if you collaborate maybe with other doctors in your community and you come together and go, Hey, let's all kind of work under this one brand. Now we can go and do a radio ad or a television ad because those definitely have a, a, a great return for us. For sure. And I just want to point out planning is such a big, a big deal, whether it's nine locations, three doctors, or just one doctor in your office alone. So many docs, it's like pulling teeth, trying to get them to plan for the quarter, much less yeah. a year, two years in advance is such a key thing to know Definitely. where your dollars are going and just how to forecast things. 
The last thing is collaboration. And this is actually how you and I even know each other, yeah. uh, is uh, how had, or have you had much opportunity to collaborate with other doctors and healthcare professionals outside of your specialty? And how has that served your practice? Uh, we, we have, I mean, because we have our uh, interventional pain management centers and obviously employ those types of doctors, our uh, board certified anesthesiologists and medical doctors and pain doctors, it's really opened up the doors for us to work with other types of surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, podiatrists, urologists, neurospine. And, um, you know, before I couldn't get them to return a call back in the day, but now all of a sudden, you know, I'm getting those calls and they're wondering, how can we work with you guys? Because I see that you have this going on or that going on. And uh, it's just, you know, for me, irrespective of the degrees or the initials before or after the name, for me in any type of business, and I think why uh, our, our paths cross is just if I can get to know somebody, know them as a person, and I, and I feel comfortable and things are genuine, then I'm willing to work with them. But I think the collaboration is key. I think collaboration in healthcare is key. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a little biased because we, we operate and own uh, integrated practices, which I think provides such a value for the patient. The fact that they can see multiple providers under one roof and not have to bounce around trying to get their records to one office or the other office and doctors yeah. not talking to each other. I mean, I wish there was a way for me to measure how much quicker people, people get better when they're in an integrated model versus a not, you know, I just think it's such a better service for the patient, you know, so that would be awesome to quantify that. Yeah. That would be awesome to quantify that, right? I know, right? That would be a great, I just, I don't know how to do it, so. But yeah, it is brilliant from the care that the patient is getting, but also the quality control that you have, uh, knowing the, the, the tier of care that they're getting. So it's not just drugs and surgery first all the time. Never. Absolutely not. I mean, we, we are still very sound with our philosophy. Uh, you know, we we're, we're very big on that. And I just got, when I was in practice, I just, I got fed up with my patients, you know, going, you know what, I'm going to go check out my primary care. Or I'm going to go do this. And I'm like, this is not good. You know, we got to change something. And that's when we changed our brand completely and what we offered and, and made a huge shift. Um, uh, oh my gosh, like 11 years ago. So it's been a while. <laughs> way to go. Now, now we're going to enter the fire rapid round. Are you ready for this? Wait, let's do it. Okay. Do I, have a I have a buzzer though. Do I need a buzzer? <laughs> you don't need a buzzer, but I'm going to ask you some questions that I just want you to answer quickly with whatever comes to mind. Okay. So the first one is, in hindsight, being in business for so long, what should be the two top areas of focus in practice? Communication and systems. Love it. What's the best advice that you've ever received? Mm, take care of your employees. I love that. What is one thing that you see consistently in every successful business owner? Communication systems. <laughs> Love it. And then the last one is more about giving back. Uh, do you have a resource that you can share, like a resource for business that you can share with our listeners? In regards to what? What do you mean? Like, like you mentioned like books and podcasts or affirmations or coaching. Is there anything specific that, that really touched you? Well, I'm, I'm still, I came back from uh, Tony Robbins, UPW like two months ago, three months ago. And, uh, I just thought that was such a game changer for me. Um, it was definitely a good time for me to go to something like that. So I think that his things that he, the things that he puts out there, and I know if you listen to them and uh, maybe even attended, have just been uh, been awesome. They've been proven, and um, so that's that's kind of that's that's kind of what I'm feeding my body with right now. So, so. what I want to ask you a question on that: What's the difference between for you? it being like a pep rally that gets you really pumped up to actual like being helpful in your business and making progress and change being making it life changing. Well, I think that when you go to an event like that, uh, and I, and I know that it's a, it's, it is, it's 14,000 people jumping up and down. I mean, right. it's crazy. It is. I think that if you bring back and it's, you know, 15 hour days for four days in a row, if you bring back that energy, and my staff, my executive team here was so anxious for me to come in on Monday afterwards. And they're like, tell us all about it. I'm like, I don't even know where to start. You know? right. But if you don't bring some of that back into your team, then, you know, yes, it's good for yourself and your, your, your cleansing of yourself and whatnot and motivating yourself. But I really just gave myself two or three days to kind of get that information. Go, okay, what's going to apply to my current team? What are we going to do? How are we going to implement this information? Because 
I think a lot of us have gone to conferences over a weekend, continue ad, and at the conference, like, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and come Monday, nothing changes at all. You know, so I think it's just being disciplined, being disciplined to implement the things you've learned. Right. And just kind of taking a few nuggets and actually implementing them. And that's what I want our listeners to do today from this podcast, because there's been some great nuggets in here. How can folks get a hold of you? Because I know some people are saying like, dude, this, this guy has an integration like dialed in. How can I connect with him to either pick his brain or work with him? How can they contact you? Whatever you want. They can email me. You're free to give them my cell phone. I'm, okay. I'm very easy to get a hold of via text. Email is great. Um, you know, I, I'd be, I mean, I, I, I didn't know what I know now if it wasn't for people that helped me along the way. So, you know, I, you know, if I have an opportunity to help other people even do anything to improve their practice, I'd be, I mean, I'd be willing to do it as best I can. So. Awesome. Perfect. And I'll put his information in the show notes and any links that we come up with as well. Dr. Roddy, thank you so much for joining us and giving us all that knowledge and value. Thank you so much for having me. You bet. And to the listeners, thank y'all so much for tuning in and stay classy, folks.